welcome everyone um, from the West Coast to the East and to the North, and I guess everyone in between. Uh, welcome to the last event in the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada's Speaker Series of 2021-22. As always, I am your host, Eric Storey. I'm the Outreach Manager of the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada in Waterloo, Ontario and a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Wilfrid Laurier University. Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples. In 1701, this land fell under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, a treaty that was part of the Great Peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars of the 17th century. It represented and continues to represent today an eternal agreement to share, to not only share and protect resources, but also solve conflicts peacefully. Eighty some years later, in 1784, the Haldimand Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and British Crown following the American Revolution, and the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from its source just north of Orangeville today to Lake Erie. Despite being reduced to less than 5% of its original size, this treaty territory remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities today, as well as the home of many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. Acknowledging their presence and relationship to the land in the past and present reminds us that these nations remain the original stewards of the lands and waters upon which the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada resides and the role we all should play as treaty people. Now, as much as I'm sad that this is our last event for 2021-2022 speaker series, I am very excited to introduce tonight's speaker. And I know that I say that every single time that we have these uh, speaker series events, but there's a particular reason and a different reason, I think, uh, why I am excited um, for tonight's speaker. And I actually remember first reading our speaker's work when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Saskatchewan, and I started there in 2010. And I remember being assigned her article um, on, on working on oral histories in, in her home community. And I remember seeing kind of the layered complexities that she um, encountered doing oral history work, not only within her own community, but also within uh, with, with her own family or with her own family members. And I remember her discussing kind of the, the complexity of both being an insider um, as being part of the community, but also an outsider as a researcher. Um, and again, these kind of complexities that she encountered. And as I progressed throughout graduate school, beyond my undergraduate days at the University of Saskatchewan, I came to Laurier and Waterloo. And I remember in several classes, I was assigned not only that article, but several of her um, other articles moving forwards. And what I realized in reading several of our speakers' articles over time was what resonated with me most. Um, and it's the case for, it's, I guess it's just my favorite type of history to read, is that is that history that's deeply personal and intimate. Um, social history, the, social, the, the history of individuals, the history from the bottom up. And I think that our speaker does this exceptionally well. And when the, when the center underwent a rebranding exercise last year, um, from one that was based on the study of military history to one now based on the study of Canada, and I was tasked with assembling the first lineup under this new banner, under the center's new banner, I knew exactly that I wanted tonight's speaker to be on that list or in that lineup, I should say. And fortunately she agreed. And many of you will know tonight's speaker. Her name is Dr. Leanne Letty. She's a member of Serpent River First Nation and is Associate Professor of Indigenous Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. She is the author of Serpent River, Serpent River Resurgence, Confronting Uranium Mining in Elliott Lake, published with the University of Toronto Press. And it was just actually released in the past couple of weeks. So I think this is, I think this is one of the first, if not the first um, kind of formal book talks that she's given. And if it is, that's even, even better. Um, but we actually have um, available for you um, this, this book, Serpent River Resurgence, for a 25% discount. And I'll make sure to share the link with you in the chat, um, as well as the discount code that you will need to enter when you purchase the book. But before I, I turn things over to Dr. Letty, I just want to have two quick reminders to our 
uh, to our audience as I always do. Um, I've turned on closed captioning. And if you find that at all distracting during, the, during uh, tonight's talk, just go down to the bottom of your screen and click that CC button and you can turn it on and off. And the second thing that I would like to remind everyone is that if a question comes to you at any point during the presentation, feel free to just enter it right into the Q&A function again at the bottom of the window. Um, you won't distract the speaker and it will actually allow you to enjoy the, the presentation more because you won't have that question percolating in your mind. And when you do ask that question, please let me know or let us know where you're coming from, because it's always so much fun to know where our audience is kind of scattered across the country and even across the world. So please do let us know where you're coming from. Without any further delay, however, um, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Leanne Letty for tonight's talk, which is entitled Cold War Colonialism on Anishinaabek Responses to Uranium Mining at Elliott Lake. All right, miigwech Eric for that kind introduction. Ani, Bojo, Leanne Letty, and Dishnikaz, Ganabajang, Nanaljaba, Waterloo, and Dayan. My name is Leanne Letty. I'm a member of the Serpent River First Nation, and I grew up in Elliott Lake, Ontario, in Robinson Huron Treaty Territory. I come to you from Waterloo this evening, which is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty area and is on the Haldeman Tract just six miles on each side of the Grand River promised to the Haudenosaunee after the American War of Independence. It is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek and the neutral people, and it has a vibrant urban Indigenous community today. Miigwech to the Center for the, uh, the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada, uh, and in particular, uh, Eric and Matt, who've done a lot of the work to, uh, to make this happen tonight, uh, for hosting this lecture, and thank you all for joining me this evening. In this talk, I will be sh sharing portions of my new book, Serpent River Resurgence, Confronting Uranium Mining at Elliott Lake, which has just been published by the University of Toronto Press. I got to hold it in my hands last week. It was very exciting. Um, in the study, I, uh, which was supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, I discussed Serpent River First Nations resilience in confronting colonial extractive practices during the Cold War, Cold War period. Relying on oral and, oral and archival research methods, I argue that Anishinaabek responses to the devastating impacts of uranium mining in our territory were framed by a powerful understanding of health and homeland. Before I begin, I want to share my approach to this research. As Eric mentioned, it is incredibly personal. As you will no doubt see this evening, my research has roots in and was inspired by the work of my grandmother and other community leaders in their struggle to address the river pollution due to uranium mining and the contamination through the establishment of a sulfuric acid plant on the reserve. In the late 1980s, when this work was going on, I was a child watching and listening. As I pursued history at the graduate level, I understood that archival research and traditional Western historical methods would also be helpful to tell this story. To that end, I completed archival research at Library and Archives Canada, the Archives of Ontario, Laurentian University Archives, the Elliott Lake Public Library, and the Serpent River First Nation Library. I also used the Elliott Lake Standard extensively as a newspaper source. Most importantly to me, and what is reflective of how I became interested in this story in the first place, was learning about it from community members who lived through it. I conducted interviews with elders at Serpent River First Nation in 2008, 2009, and I had the privilege to learn from my grandmother, Gertrude Lewis, as well as Valerie Commanda, Arnelda Jacobs, Betty Jacobs, Terry Jacobs, and Peter Johnson. I did a later 2014 interview with Frank Lewis, who also gave me insight into this community history. Some of these elders, including my grandmother, have since passed, and I'm grateful to all of them for sharing their expertise with me. I wanted to take a moment to explain terminology as well before we begin. I use the term Indian when referring to the Department of Indian Affairs, often shortened to DIA, throughout this talk. And while the term Indian is a misnomer when talking about indig Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, it is the most common departmental name or the variations on it throughout the historical period I'm talking about tonight. I may also use the term when quoting directly from an historical source uh, when its use was more common. But it's important to note that it is not in use today. And in my own analysis and everyday speech, I use Anishinaabek, which is the name we have for ourselves, or Indigenous, if the more general term is appropriate. So let me start around the mid-19th century. 
when the Serpent's Band, as we were called, named after the river that bears our name, appeared in the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. In it, we are the seventh community listed uh, on our reserve. Uh, and it's defined as the peninsula east of the Serpent River and formed by it, now occupied by them. And this is an important phrase. The serpent that shares Anishinaabe territory is said to have a den where the mouth of the Serpent River meets Lake Huron. And according to elders of the Serpent River First Nation who formed the group called Elder T in their book, they uh, connected to the land, they wrote, the reason the river is so twisted is that it was formed by the serpent as it moved, wiggling its body as it traveled. The importance of the serpent continues with elders and community members sharing sightings from time to time. And as Arnelda Jacob shared with me in 2009, she said, he's here to help us. Stories such as these demonstrate the importance of land and water to us. I also want to take a moment to describe the differences between settler notions of a reserve boundary and our own understandings of traditional territory. These connections throughout our territory are apparent even after the Treaty of 1850, when the reserve became more settled in the 1880s. Traditional uses of land included such patterns as making maple syrup in family units once spring was coming, a tradition I continue in my own family in my suburban backyard. My family and others continued trapping throughout the territory at certain parts of the year well into the 20th century. Serpent River Anishinaabek also practiced agriculture or kept gardens to produce food. And so this modicional economy, as I mentioned, was practiced well into the 20th century and caused concerns for the Department of Indian Affairs as they watched and wrote about our ancestors over the course of a century. One such report written in 1858, written so before Confederation and just eight years after the treaty, they noted that the Anishinaabek on the North Shore were hunting, fishing, growing potatoes and corn, as well as trading furs, while also noting that, quote, they are quite nomadic in their habits, seldom living or remaining long in one spot. Throughout the latter part of the 19th century, state officials would continue to document, however disparagingly, what they called the nomadic nature of the Anishinaabek on the North Shore and their traditional connections to territory. Yet given the remoteness of the place from settler population centers, the community was largely left alone, at least at this point. As was the case in decades past, the people known as the Serpent's Band participated in a seasonal round focused on the river, along which they typically lived in the summer months. Hunting, fishing, gathering, limited farming, and trapping remain the most important activities. While many people continue to engage in traditional seasonal movement throughout Anishinaabek territory, those who settled in the area were subjected to growing surveillance by officials from the new Department of Indian Affairs. This is the term I will use throughout despite its various name changes throughout history. In his 1874 annual report, J.C. Phipps, who was a visiting superintendent, echoed the concerns from 1858 about the daily lives of the Serpent's Band. He said, the Indians raise only a small quantity of corn and potatoes. They maintain themselves by hunting and fishing. As late as 1884, Phipps reported that there were still several families who chose to remain on the land, at least for part of the year, rather than settle on their reserves along the North Shore. Those who were still, for the most part, nomadic in their habits, as they phrased it, did not raise crops, but came to the reserve area in the summer. And so we can see these kinds of descriptions in the record that, Indian, that indicate Indian Affairs views of Anishinaabe ways of life. And here uh, is a, a map to show you, situate us a little bit here at the bottom. You can see that's the North Shore of Lake Huron, and uh, you can see some of the settler um, uh, towns as well as uh, Cutler, which is located on Serpent River First Nation. From my perspective, our Anishinaabe ancestors continued to live their lives as they had incorporating change that served their needs and more settlers moved into Northern Ontario to participate in lumber extraction. In interviews conducted in the 1980s, community elders linked the timber industry to families coming to settle more permanently on the reserve territory in the Cutler village. Timber harvesting and mill jobs on the reserve were used to entice community members to settle on a more permanent basis nearer to the Cutler village, as they would have access to wage jobs, a school, and other amenities. The development of the lumber mill coincided with the department's pursuit of measurable benchmarks of assimilation, including material prosperity and hard work, as defined by Indian Affairs. 
The first lease was signed and agreed to in March 1894, and the settler village that developed on leased reserve land as a result of the mill was named after Dwight Cutler, one of the owners of the company. Within a year of the assignment to Cutler and Savage, B.W. Ross, the Indian superintendent, summarized the movement of many of the 122 band members to the village of Cutler during the previous summer in order to take advantage of employment opportunities at the mill and noted that they were, quote, doing well. While the sales or lease of reserve resources for the benefit of Indian Affairs Administration was not a new concept, it appears that from the perspective of DIA, this land transaction had the added bonus of curtailing Anishinaabe mo movement and encouraged them to settle in one place to take advantage of wage labor opportunities. The development of the lumber industry and the arrival of the CPR railway started a pattern of extraction and land leasing on our homeland that facilitated devastating mid 20th century of events once uranium was found decades later. And here you can see the uh, atom, which you can see at the uh, at the uh, when, at the entrance to Elliott Lake. By the mid twentieth century, uranium was in demand in the context of Cold War weapons development. However, at the same time, Serpent River First Nation had to contend with profound change brought brought on by further settlement and industrialization. In other words, Serpent River First Nation had to contend with a modern town site that had been built to house miners and their families, of which my father's family was one, and the mining operations that threatened the river system after which the community was named. The largest uranium find in Ontario is known colloquially in local lore as the backdoor staking bee. Catherine Dixon, a longtime resident of Elliott Lake and a former journalist um, and who has written a lot on these issues, uh, details the search for uranium in the area east of Blind River from the late 1940s onward. She attributes the discovery of uranium to independent prospectors, likely encouraged in their endeavor by local news reporting, which promised that a successful claim would pave the way to personal economic fortune. And by the 1950s, more and more independent prospectors were staking claims, and a Sault Ste. Marie hotel owner by the name of Aimé Breton and his employee Carl Gunterman purchased several lapsed claims from the Long Township in the district of Algoma. In 1952, Gunterman also allowed the claims to lapse, even though Breton had instructed him to maintain them. Frank R. Jubin and Joseph H. Hershorn purchased the twice lapsed claims. And Gunterman met Jubin on the land when they were both prospecting in the area. And Jubin sub subsequently had become very interested in the potential of the Breton uh, Gunterman claims. So the result was this backdoor staking bee during the spring and summer of 1953, in which a group of independent prospectors, as well as some employed by Jubin and Hershorn, chartered flights from the Porcupine region and flew into the area in secret. Over the next six weeks, more than 70 prospectors, geologists, cooks, and pilots worked to stake thousands of claims in the area, but their activities did not become public until the 12th of July, 1953, two days after their claims were filed. When their secret was leaked, excitement swept the region as prospectors jumped on the bandwagon, hoping to cash in on a potentially large find. While the physical act of prospecting is at one level an individual undertaking, from the very beginning, the exploitation of the claims staked in 1953 became a private public partnership involving mining companies and both federal and provincial governments. This partnership created the town of Elliott Lake, which is evident in the geographical names of the town today. One of the community's unique features is the street names, which reflect the links between the environment, industry, and government. In one area, the streets are named after tree species, while in the center of town, they are named after leading private individuals responsible for the establishment of the mining industry. And in a third neighborhood, the names of prime ministers are used, with Pearson Drive as situated as its backbone. It's not surprising that the urban geography should reflect this reality in a town built and sustained by a partnership between industry and government. And indeed, there would be several points in the town's history uh, when the industry at Elliott Lake would be sustained by government stockpiling initiatives. The uranium economy at Elliott Lake, which was subject to a boom-bust economic cycle like any other single industry town, was thus shaped by this larger socio-political changes and private-public partnerships from its very beginning. And 12 mines quickly came into operation and the federal government entered into a lucrative contract with the Atomic Energy Commission in the United States in 1957 
underlining the extent to which the state was involved in uranium production and its export. A cooperative public-private public partnership was imperative to create a town site closer to the ore body so as to fil facilitate its extraction. And given the remoteness of the mine sites to existing towns and transportation infrastructure, it was clear that a town site would have to be carved from the rock, to borrow a title of a recent historical documentary on the history of Elliott Lake. In the beginning, there were makeshift camps to house male employees, but mining officials thought that there should also be more permanent sites for family housing. Newspaper reports of the time highlight the rapid and sometimes unnerving pace of development, but always emphasize that the local settler population was engaged in an act of civilization building, literally carving a new and useful, from their perspective, town from what was formerly, uh, or formerly an underused wilderness, in stark contrast, of course, to Anishinaabek views of land. This settler narrative of progress and economic boom and bust silences Anishinaabek voices on whose homeland these mines were built, while ushering in a new stage of a, in the colonial relationship. The area 30 kilometers north of Lake Huron had long been the traditional tra trapping, hunting, fishing, and spiritual center for the people of Serpent River First Nation. While the Robinson-Huron Treaty signed in 1850 attempted to relegate the Anishinaabek to a reserve on the north shore of the lake, community members still fostered their strong ties to the traditional land base. 100 years later, after the treaty, prospecting and a peculiar pact between big uranium business and government had a profound change on the entire ecosystem, having disastrous impacts on the First Nations community that found itself downstream. And here uh, I've shared uh, a map from the book, which is the uh, where you can see the watershed, uh, the uranium mines, as well as the tailings areas there. So Elliott Lake is in a darker color. Um, the waterways are the light gray, uh, and you can see the shape of the Serpent River uh, as it winds its way down into Lake Huron, um, as well as the tailings management areas. So these mines, however, had this devastating impact on Serpent River on the watershed. You can see here the waterway as well as the locations of the tailings management sites or the dead lakes. Community knowledge holders remember early use of the land and water system and the changes that took place once, once mining activity began in the 1950s. The development of industrial and mining operations brought about a dramatic change to the myriad ways in which members of the Serpent River First Nation interacted with the traditional territory. And by the 1960s, there were concerns about water quality as a result of these mining operations. Questions of federal provincial responsibility cast a shadow on the need to protect the drinking water of town residents, as well as those living in communities downstream. Peter Johnson, an elder who had advocated for the health of the river, recalled the effect this debate had on Serpent River First Nation and the in inequities inherent in the jurisdictional issue. So as he said, uh, shared with me, I think that it was through public relations through the media when they, the neighboring settler town of Serpent River, so there's Serpent River First Nation and then there's Serpent River uh, on the other side of the river, which is a settler uh, village. Um, when they found out that the water contained high amounts of radium and because it was a white community, they went to the provincial government because they were getting their drinking water for the, from the river. And they said to the provincial government, we know our water has been contaminated by the mines. We need funding from you guys in order to find a process that will eliminate it, that so it's not a danger to our health. And so that's in fact what happened. The provincial government provided them with the money to build a treatment plant. At the very same time that was happening, some members of our community were taking water from the river for their own use. And when, the, when they went to the federal government and said, you know, there's a high, high radium contents in the water and it's above the provincial drinking water standard, the federal government's response was, well, the standard for the federal government was 10 picocuries per liter. So it wasn't okay for the white community, but it was okay for the Indian community to drink the very same water just because of the different jurisdictions. We fought tooth and nail for years and years and years to get that standard lowered. And eventually we embarrassed the government enough that they finally did bring it down to the provincial standard. But in the meantime, though, I mean, people drank their water. And indeed, the province of Ontario had a safety standard of three picocuries per liter um, and samples taken from the from the river at the reserve measured as high as 6.2. However, the federal government did not consider that level of radioactivity to be significantly dangerous as its safe level was defined as being 10 uh, picocuries 
Pico curies per liter. While the settler communities could be protected by provincial standards, despite being vulnerable to water pollution stemming from mining operations at Elliott Lake, the Serpent River First Nation was governed by federal standards because the status Indians and lands reserved for them fall under federal jurisdiction under the British North America Act. In an article in the Globe and Mail, which called attention to this inequality on the basis of indigeneity and jurisdiction, the National Indian Brotherhood, so this is the forerunner of the Assembly of First Nations, they sent a representative, Lloyd Tatterin, and he was paraphrased as saying, it is wrong to have different standards for whites and Indians. Indians at Serpent River Reserve were allowed to ingest up to 10 picocuries per liter, while upstream, white cottagers were protected by the more stringent three picocuries standard. It was not until the 1970s that attention was called to the fact that the federal standards for radioactivity and drinking water differed from those of the provincial government, but it took lobbying on the part of Serpent River First Nation and the National uh, Indian Brotherhood to accomplish this. In her recollection of community concerns over drinking water safety, Gertrude Lewis also noted this jurisdictional issue. So Gertrude is my grandmother, and in her interview, she shared with me, and we complained that they didn't do anything for us. We had three families getting their water from Serpent River up at the bridge there. And there were three families that were living there and they couldn't get any help to put in any protection for our water up there. They didn't do anything for them. And yet in Serpent River, and here she means the, the neighboring settler community, they were paying for water treatment for the people there. And that's another thing we were complaining about. How can they can do that for, you know, off reserve and on reserve, they don't seem to care whether we get, have good water or not. In addition to frustration and activism to combat jurisdictional racism, community elders have long memories that recall family ties to the land and river system. Terry Jacobs recalled that his father had made his living hunting and trapping near Black Creek, which is part of the watershed, but his livelihood was comprised, uh, compromised by the river pollution as more and more elders of his generation realized that the animal population had diminished and those that remained, the beaver in particular, had been affected to the point where it threatened the community's ability to harvest. Betty recalled that her father-in-law, Betty Jacobs was uh, married to, uh, to Terry Jacobs, and she recalled that her father-in-law had to stop trapping altogether due to the poor quality of his pelts and the difficulty in obtaining them, saying, he had to quit. Even the fur, he was trying to do whatever they do to skin the beaver and it broke right off. Even the fur was no good. And her husband, Terry, described a generational shift in dependence on the land as a result of this pollution and the loss of rich resources. As he said, the elders just before me, they enjoyed all this trapping, hunting and trapping, and they had to get away from that. The meat might be contaminated. And he had a long pause and then went on to tell me that Betty, his wife, had been sick with cancer and that she had a love for this beaver meat, making a connection between her illness and what she had eaten. This personal history not only contains important information about the changes in the community's access to resources over time, but it also underlines one of the main concerns that Serpent River First Nation members had about uranium, its effects on their well-being. It was more than disturbing that, it, sorry, it was more than the disturbing fact that the traditional lifestyles and ways were being disrupted. They could also make one sick. And the connectivity that had always been a part of life, which I had described earlier, was now threatening it. I want to turn now to the sulfuric acid plant that was established on the reserve. The summer of 1955 brought news of this development. The local production of sulfuric acid to extract uranium was essential to building the industrial basis for the town of Elliott Lake, and the local newspapers focused solely on the economic and industrial benefits of such a plant. As the uh, leader spectator reported in 1955, to produce the large daily tonnages of, sulfur of sulfuric acid required in the chemical leaching process to be used on the Blind River uranium ores, Naranda Mines will, be cons will construct a multi-million dollar acid plant in the area. The all-important raw material will be pyrites from its own Ruan holdings. A unique Naranda developed process will turn out daily some 350 tons of high-grade iron sinter, around 70 tons of elemental sulfur, an estimated 500 tons of sulfuric acid. The newspapers also lauded it as another example of industrial consolidation and efficiency that would contribute to the area's positive economic and social development. And so the ideal site to house such an operation from the government's perspective was located on the reserve. 
and was thus on land controlled by the Department of Indian Affairs, which could be influenced by federal interests in promoting development at Elliott Lake, as well as strategic considerations to find uranium. The department was also already anxious to promote industrial employment for the local indigenous population, which it saw as clinging to what, the, what they saw as a backward way of life. Trapping is still a very important factor in the Indian economy and will be for many years yet, lamented a 1959 departmental report on the economic development of indigenous peoples in Northern Ontario. It went on to say this type of work, arduous though it may be, is accepted by those Indians who have not been in close touch with industrial development. But where they have been so exposed more and more are realizing the benefits of steadier work and a regular income. It is clear that the Department of Indian Affairs saw steady wage work as the way to encourage the community to engage what they saw as progress. The community, or sorry, the building of the acid plant at Elliot at, at the building of the acid plant at Cutler was thus seen as an important step in the colonization of local Anishinaabek. The Department of Indian Affairs attributed the community's dismal economic situation to their tendency to cling to such as they saw outmoded economic means as trapping and subsistence hunting and fishing. And the department saw industrialization as a way to move reserve reserves and their occupants into the 20th century. Moreover, the department saw employment at the acid plant as a way to make reserve residents less dependent on government funds. With the excellent opportunities for employment now available on the reserve, relief should be at a minimum, reported the local Indian agent to his district supervisor. Full-scale participation in the wage economy and the resource extraction in the area was seen as a positive development. This sentiment dominated the interactions of the Department of Indian Affairs with Indigenous peoples at the time, as modernization and integration were important general tenets of Indian Affairs policy. In this case, government policy reflected popular opinions, and locally, the press lauded the idea of modernization through industrialization. In Cutler, Noranda Mines provides a regular source of employment here, and the Serpent River Reserve is luckier than others, read an article in the Elliott Lake Standard. Previously, the Indians living there depended upon fishing, trapping, and the lumber industry. In days gone by, local Indians functioned largely as family units, hunting and moving from place to place, practicing conservation as they went. End quote. The equation of industrialization with economic progression and the success of the colonial relationship is obviously, obviously ethnocentric, but the official and popular ethnocentrism and the Whiggish acceptance of Western capitalist concepts of labor and wages that it entailed actually justified the paternalistic need to control and encourage Anishinaabek economic life. In early 1955, Naranda approached the community and the Department of Indian Affairs about the possibility of establishing an acid plant on the reserve. And the department officials were thrilled with the prospect as they had been encouraging economic development and secure employment in the community since the 19th century. And at this point, Serpent River First Nation was not what they considered to be self-sustaining uh, and the roads, houses and facilities had all fallen into disrepair. Of course, they're blaming Indigenous peoples for this, not the way uh, the, the constraints of, of the colonial relationship. When Naranda offered to pay uh, $7,000 to lease the land for the acid plant, J.T. O'Neill, the Indian Affairs Superintendent for the Sault Ste. Marie Agency, reported to Ottawa that the reserve's problems would be solved. He wrote, with the industrial development in that area, I expect a general increase in all matters pertaining to this band. Indeed, O'Neill used the expected prosperity to justify the First Nations budget, which included repairs to roads and buildings, as well as recreation equipment. And the methods through which the acid plant became, came to be located on Serpent River First Nation reveal the continuation of the colonial relationship between the federal government, particularly DIA, and the reserve. It also emphasizes the complexity of the colonial experience, as many in the community welcomed the jobs that the plant seemed to offer. And even so, leadership and some members of the community attempted to ask questions so as to fulfill their traditional relationship with land and water. And indeed, not everyone in the community agreed that industry and jobs should be accepted so easily. 
community members' oral history suggests that DIA, anxious to uh, bring industry to the reserve, controlled the negotiations and pushed through the lease of the land. And in fact, they relied on an old lumber lease that had never been properly returned back to the community uh, to be able to facilitate that. Several public meetings were held, which many elders remember attending. Gertie Lewis recalled the ways in which DIA officials at those meetings downplayed the fears of community members. And she told me, the community was invited to all these meetings, she says. Although most of the people thought it was a good thing, some of our young people would want to ask questions. We'd try to ask for a lawyer to look into it. And they said, we don't need a lawyer because the band didn't need a lawyer because they had all the lawyers they needed in Ottawa, Indian Affairs. Indeed, a report entitled Background Information, Highlights of the History of the Cutler Acid Site, commissioned in the mid-1980s by the Serpent River First Nation leadership, supports these community members' recollections. The band was concerned about the lease with Naranda for the construction of the sulfuric acid-making factories and requested the presence of their own lawyer, it reads. The Department of Indian Affairs officials told the band that the government lawyers would protect the band's interests. It was not long after the plant began operating that the community leaders realized there was a problem. William Miyawasaki, who had overseen the reacquisition of band lands a decade before, um, had, was quickly reelected as chief. And one of his main initiatives after his reelection was to try and rescind the, the band's surrender of its mineral rights and to begin pressing for compensation to personal property that was damaged by the fumes from the plant, as well as reforestation. As those who had been skeptical of the plant had feared, any economic prosperity was fleeting and left a legacy of environmental destruction that hurt rather than improved the long-term prospects of the community. Of course, we thought it would be a good thing for our area because there was no work in our area, recalled Gertrude Lewis, and we thought there'd be employment and our living would be better. We weren't thinking of the destruction of our wildlife and the trees and gardens that followed from the plant. We didn't know about that. They didn't tell us how it would affect anything. For Lewis, employment was clearly only one part of a larger picture that included responsibility for protecting the land. Jerry J Terry Jacobs had similar reflections about the consultative process and why community members agreed to the plant's establishment. No, we didn't know what the consequences would have been, you know, he told me. I suppose we would have known if maybe we had one of our members of the community or council go to see, like Naranda, it was an operation then, what damage there had been around that, that area maybe we wouldn't have accepted it. In any case, the jobs that followed were dangerous. While the influx of steady employment was beneficial to some community members in the short term, many found that working in a sulfuric acid plant had dire health consequences. In the case of Lawrence Lewis, my grandfather and Gertrude's husband, this meant the purchase of new uniforms and equipment was often necessary due to damage incurred by the hazardous work environment. As Gertie shared, and then his clothes were always burned. Almost every week he had to buy new clothes for work because they had little holes in them, burned. And I guess it depended on where you were working in the plant too, you know, if you work right where the fumes were and everything. And then he just worked on labor work and that, that was dirty, working right in, you know, where all the dirt was and everything. And he got burned on his face with some of the acid. I don't know how that happened. He still has a scar today on his face and you can see it if you look at him, a little mark there. The plant provided jobs, but it clearly it was dangerous work. Terry Jacobs described some of the hazards that he encountered. There were times where you couldn't wear the gas masks in there, he said in an earlier interview found in the book entitled, This is My Homeland. He said the diaphragms would freeze up and you'd choke yourself. You didn't get anything else. In addition to the health and safety risks posed by these jobs, the plant caused deforestation, holes in people's laundry when it was out on the line, damage to homes and cars, and rashes on children who swam in Arid Bay, which is located on Lake Huron. And um, I'm not sure you might be able to see a little corner of it uh, at the bottom of the screen of this picture. As Arnelda Jacobs recalled, it took all the trees. The northern wind used to blow south and it used to affect the trees. There were no trees up there on the side of the hill. As my grandmother recalled, well, the sulfur fumes were really bad because when we lived right across from the plant, we couldn't even leave the windows open in the summertime because of the fumes. When the fish caught in Arid Bay were eaten, and in some cases, the pollution could be tasted. We got a nice bass, recalled Terry Jacobs, one of those nice ones in the evening. And I thought, when we go home, we're going to cook that right away. And we tried, but it tasted like it was rotten. 
And according to Peter Johnson, the fish population of the Bay Area also decreased. Well, I think that was what happened is that it used to come, it used to be common to fish close by, he said. And as the effects of the effluent from the plant over the years got worse and it accumulated in the lake, the fish just couldn't take it anymore. And the ones that didn't die just didn't come in. They weren't there anymore. They found other places that were more habitable to live in. And so you didn't have the fish in the lake anymore that you used to have. In addition to the very real impacts on land and water, I mentioned that the jobs were fleeting. When Aranda sold the plant to the Cutler Acid Limited, it ceased operations in 1963. There was no substantial cleanup, however, and the company left the refuse there. Chief Bill Miwasagi called for a cleanup and used the local newspaper to call attention to the issue. The government's answer came two years later in the form of exercise serpent pow or powder serpent, a training exercise held for 110 members of number one field squadron, Royal Canadian Engineers. The exercise was intended to both demolish the plant and provide the army with an opportunity for live fire training. In late August, 1969, the unit began a multi-week operation that was witnessed by interested parties of both the Canadian and American armed forces. The squadron camped near the site and had its food and water transported from Elliott Lake. By the end of October, all the buildings had blown, been blown up at a cost of over $100,000. The demolition by explosives leveled the building, but scattered contaminated pieces of rubble over a wider area. It would take two more decades and continuous pressure from the community for substantial improvement. By the late 1980s, community leadership was still calling for a proper cleanup of the site. We started putting pressure on the federal government for funding to do a proper cleanup, recalled Peter Johnson, and it must have taken us at least 10 years of real hard work. I remember being at Indian Affairs in Toronto at the regional office and pounding my fist on the table with the people from Indian Affairs trying to get them to understand how determined we were that there was a problem and that it was their problem, not ours. But it was really, really hard. I mean, they were civil servants living far, far away from the problem. As long as it didn't affect their daily lives to the extent that it was affecting ours, it wasn't the problem as we saw it. And so it was a lot of real hard bargaining. We ended up going to using every means that we had available to us. But it was, I'm telling you, I mean, it drained us. The amount of energy and time and money we spent just fighting to get the money to do the cleanup was just awful. Experience had taught community leaders that the government was not protecting their interests, and so they entered into their own negotiations. The Department of Indian Affairs was no benevolent protector. It was both the defendant and the organization that continued to block the community's goals. And as a result, community members grew weary of endless meetings and promises of studies. Serpent River First Nation leadership increasingly looked to harness public opinion to both draw attention to the problems on reserve, as well as to put pressure on the government to meet its demands for reclamation and compensation. In February 1986, Chief Earl Commander first threatened to block the Trans-Canada Highway, which runs through the community. The band council passed a resolution in January stating if we don't get a meeting with the minister that the possibility of this type of action will exist, he told the Elliott Lake Standard. We've talked about this type of action as a protest against the lack of response from Indian Affairs. While Chief Commander described the companies as well as the Provincial Ministry of the Environment, Federal Bodies, Environment Canada, and Health Canada as being willing to cooperate and support the cleanup, he blamed DIA for the delay. Our own Indian Affairs Ministry is where the thing gets bogged down. DIA had wanted to stall discussions and action in order to find out who was really responsible for the cleanup via the Department of Justice, and he recalled the original involvement of DIA and laid the blame with the ministry. They are in breach of trust. They broke our trust by allowing the plant to be built there. Commando was more explicit the following week. He said, I'm told a 24-hour blockage of Highway 17 would bring the uranium industry to its knees. In a lot of ways, we could gain negative attention. You reach a point where you just don't care. We also have the CPR line running through the reserve and an Ontario hydro line. By the end of September, community leadership was growing increasingly impatient. 
Keith Lewis, who was the, the band planner at the time, told the press, quiet negotiation has brought us along to where we are now, but it's getting us nowhere and we're forced to consider other options. These other options included blocking the highway and main east-west CPR line, cutting the Ontario Hydro North Shore transmission line, and moving the toxic waste to the edge of the highway itself. And in October, Chief Commander held the press conference announcing that the community would move the actual waste to areas outside the reserve if there was no immediate response from the government. That fall, before the snow fell, the community moved approximately 26 truckloads of waste from the acid plant to the edge of the Trans-Canada Highway. They also erected a sign outlining DIA's role in the establishment of the plant and its hesitation to provide funding for waste removal. And it read, a tribute to the government of Canada, here lie the remains of what was once a color acid plant, 9,000 truckloads of contaminated waste, owned and operated in consecutive eras by Naranda Mines and CIL. The plant shut down in 1963, leaving us with this great legacy. DIA negotiated the lease on behalf of the band and settled it without including us. The people of Serpent River Indian Band dedicate this site to them in recognition of their relentless pursuit of good on our behalf. God save the Queen. The tongue-in-cheek dedication to the federal government revealed a community member of betrayal and the long-standing sense of bitterness about three decades that it was taking for DIA to correct the situation. The words relentless pursuit of good on our behalf was an especially cutting commentary. And of course, God save the queen, not only referred to a colonial past, but also the continuing colonial patterns that defined the community's relationship to the state and sovereign. The community entered into the 1850 Robinson Huron Treaty as a partner in negotiation, but the resulting pollution and slow action exposed the erosion of such promises and the nation to nation relationship. The waste that sat at the edge of the Trans-Canada Highway for more than a year as Serpent River First Nation continued to pursue other means of negotiation and protest. And just before the Canada Day long weekend, on June 29th, 1988, the community set fire to the pile of toxic waste. The pile of waste dedicated to the federal government is now alight and Commanda said it could burn for days or months, reported the Toronto Star. Although there are no flames or sparks, the smoke, smoke can be seen for miles and a rotten egg smell permeates the area, irritating the noses and throats of residents and the Trans-Canada travellers. The burning material contains sulfur, pyrite, calcite, and cement. When asked to describe protests and other actions that were taken to call attention to the issues of land reclamation, Peter Johnson did not differentiate between political meetings in downtown Toronto and the type of visible public protests that occurred in 1988. In fact, he remembered them as being intimately linked as coordinated efforts in one instance. We had those discussions ongoing, he said. We had one big meeting that was scheduled with, I think it was a meeting we had in Toronto, and it was with the federal government departments. And when I say the federal government, I'm not saying Indian Affairs because it involved the Treasury Department, it involved Environment Canada, the Justice Department, because Justice Department were the lawyers that were handling the legal work for the Department of Indian Affairs. So it involved all these departments. We had a big, big meeting scheduled in Toronto, and we decided to have a big day of protest, and we lit the fires purposely. We lit the sulfur fires. And the, they blew, as they usually did with the westerly blow of the wind, and all the material blew across Highway 17. It closed Highway 17 down. I mean, motorists couldn't go by. And it became a real PR pro problem for the government. And we used that to its full advantage. And when we went to that meeting in Toronto, we told them, if you turn on your TV tonight, or if you turn it on right now, you'll find out how just what our people at the community level feel about this. You're not just talking to us here as leaders of our community. We're representing people at the community level and things are getting out of hand. I remember saying to them, you see the news tonight where Highway 17, the Trans-Canada Highway has been closed because of the burning of the material that is still on that site. And pretty soon, the federal government started to realize that they did have a problem. But it took us, I mean, we had to fight tooth and nail before they finally came up with the funding in order for us to do that. The Supreme River, River First Nation had found the government's weak spot. Less than a month after setting pile, a pile of toxic waste on fire, the federal government caved. On the 20th of July, 1988, it was reported that the Treasury Board had authorized 
more than $5 million in funding that was anticipated that the waste and that, and that it was anticipated that the waste removal would begin in February. To compensate the township of Shedden for taking over responsibility for the waste, the federal government paid for the construction of a football field sized disposal site, as well as an insurance liability policy, and it also offered to finance other municipal improvements. Once it was brought to the nine meter deep site, the waste would be neutralized by lime. So ended the second attempt to restore the acid plant grounds to the community, but there still remains problems with the rocks, which remain orange, as well as the sulfur spill. And here's a picture of the, uh, the reddish or orangish, orangish tinge to the rocks. By the early 1990s, it became clear that uranium mining was not going to continue at Elliott Lake. Soon, attention turned to decommissioning and perpetual care of the sites. My relative, Angela Kajajwan, spoke to the Federal Environmental Review Panel in 1993, and I thank her for her permission to include in the book these words she shared as a child. She told the panel, I'm concerned about the fact that the mines have closed. The owners are moving away and leaving the mess that we have to live with. My grandpa is a trapper. He tells me stories about the way the land was, was a long time ago. He trapped in the Elliott Lake area, and he tells us about how things have changed in the land and the animals and doesn't trust those things anymore. That makes me worried about the water, the animals, and the land. This is very important to me and my community, and please make sure they clean it up right. Miigwech. And with Angela's words that encapsulate a strong community knowledge of this history, our intimate ties to our territory, and our community's activism. This is where I'll leave it tonight. And so miigwech for joining me.